The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I'm Andrew Capehart. I'm the lead staff person for the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center at WRMA Incorporated. I'll be moderating the webinar today. Our topic is performance measurement for, off, um, for the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services grantees. So a bit of housekeeping before we get started. This session is being recorded and it will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify all attendees via email when it is posted online. You may use your telephone or your computer to connect to audio. Just select the option you prefer on your GoToWebinar control panel. An example is displayed here where you can make your selection. All participants are muted for this webinar, so there's no need to mute your line manually. If you have questions of our presenter today, you can simply type them in the questions box. An example of where to type is posted on this slide and it's circled for you. You don't have to wait until we pause for questions to submit your questions. You may type them at any time and I'll relay them to our speaker when it's time for us to pause for questions at the end of the uh, webinar. And also, if you'd like a copy of the slides from today, they're posted under the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. You can simply click on the title of the uh, slides to download them. So I'll take a brief moment to introduce today's speakers from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Community Living. We have Hillary Dallin, Director of the Office of Elder Justice and APS. Uh, Susan Jenkins, Director of the Office of Performance and Evaluation, and also Elizabeth Petrui, who's a Program Specialist with the Office of Elder Justice and APS. And first, I will turn things over to Hillary Dallin to make a few opening remarks. Hillary? Okay, thank you, Andy, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. It's actually really important that you join today because the topic of program evaluation, as, as you've been hearing from all of us here at ACL, we consider to be of utmost importance. Um, as you'll hear more from our expert presenter um, and our, our ACL expert on evaluation and guru of logic models, AKA Susan Jenkins, we, we, we can't really know if we've succeeded with grants unless we have strong evaluation standards and measures, and that's what we're talking about today. So how do we create a framework for that kind of measurement? We do it through the creation of logic models. Logic models, as many of our LEAP grantee friends who are on this call will know, um, I have said the the, a good logic model looks to be incredibly intuitive. You look at it and you say, oh, that's easy. Well, um, a good logic model that looks that easy takes a great deal of work, as any of you who've tried to do logic models will know. So Susan is going to talk about evaluation today. She's going to talk about measurement. And she's going to talk about how logic models frame evaluation and measurement, and how to do a logic model so that we can all plunge into these grants and know as we go through the next few years exactly where we're headed and what means success for each and every one of our grantees. So that, that is pretty much all I have to say. Again, thank you very much. And I do want to uh, echo what Andy said. Please ask your questions. They enrich the presentation and the learning for everybody. If you think of a question the moment this webinar is over, no worries. Think you know where to reach all of us. Keep the questions, comments, and ideas coming. Uh, they help all of us to grow stronger. So thank you very much. Thanks, Hillary. And now I'll turn things over to Elizabeth Petrui to make a few comments as well. Thank you, Andy. Um, I just want to echo Hillary's comments that we're grateful for all of you who are watching live today, um, but we hope that this webinar will continue to be a resource uh, after this afternoon has concluded because it's being recorded and you'll be able to um, continue to reference it online as you go through that logic model creation process. I also wanted to mention that this webinar is a companion to another webinar um, that was done by myself and our Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services team lead, Stephanie Whittier Eliason, 
on some of the more of the background on exactly how ACL will use your logic model once you submit it to us. Um, so look for that as well once this webinar is concluded. And that is what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And now I will turn things over to the star of our show, Susan Jenkins. Um, and I will say anecdotally, I've seen Susan speak before. She is a fantastic presenter. So Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I echo the thanks to everyone who is participating and everyone who may listen to this webinar later on. We'll start off with a short overview of what we're going to talk about, and then we'll jump right into the topic for today. We're going to talk a little bit, starting with definitions. Why do we do this? What is it actually that we're talking about when we talk about performance management, performance measurement, and evaluation? showing the distinction between those three things. Then most of the time will be spent on walking through how to develop realistic, realistic performance measures, performance indicators. And we will walk through how you can pull information out of your funding opportunity announcement, how you can tweak some of that information to fit your specific situation, your specific grant activities, after we go through a number of exercises in that area, there'll be time for questions and we'll round out with deploying. How do you use this performance measurement information throughout the life of your grant? We have some tips in that area. The final slides in the slide deck are resources for more information. If you want to read up on some of these topics, want a little bit more information or want a refresher. Next slide. Why do we do performance measurement? Why do we insist on evaluation? As Hillary and Elizabeth said, it's important. It really helps us to know what programs are doing, what's working, what's not working, where ACL should put its effort, as well as where you should put your efforts. But in addition to that, within a larger framework, it's required. All federal programs have some level of reporting requirements to account for the taxpayer funds that we are spending. So I have a couple of examples here with citations so that if you want to go back to the original documents, you always can. But the administration, this administration and past administrations have stressed for a long time that agencies need a strong evidence infrastructure. And we need to bring evidence to bear in policy decisions as well as programmatic decisions. And evaluation provides some forms of evidence, performance measurement provides some, form of some forms of evidence, and there are other areas. But as we talk about performance measurement, particularly today, that is part of why, that we, why we do it. We need a strong evidence infrastructure. The next slide shows more information about that, the 2018 budget blueprint, so that's for congressional budget reporting, requires the use of real hard data. Usually that means quantitative data, which is a lot of what we'll be talking about today, but it can also include qualitative, narrative, textual data as well. But it's important to have real, realistic, hard evidence and data to support our programs. The next slide also continues with this idea that we need to effectively and efficiently deliver our programs. How do we know if we're effective if we don't have data to show that people, communities, families, and organizations are different as a result of our programming and our efforts? And we need to make sure that we're doing things efficiently. There may be multiple ways to get to the same point, to make the same change, and with performance measures, we can see what works best for whom and in what context so we can do that rather than doing things that maybe are less effective and are using money inefficiently. The next slide pulls from the analytical perspectives of 2019 and again talks about bringing evidence to bear in decision making. We need evidence for making our funding decisions at the federal level Similarly, you need evidence at the state, local, provider, at every other level to make decisions about who to fund, how much to fund, what to focus on. We never have enough money to do all of the things that we would want to do, all of the things that we think it might be important to do. So we have to have evidence to help us to make those decisions about what to fund, when to fund it, who to fund, those kinds of things. 
and agencies, so that's federal agencies from the analytical perspectives, but all agencies and organizations should integrate quality evidence for from program evaluations, monitoring activities, and other forms of evidence to really help to make those decisions. Now we're gonna turn on the next slide to some definitions. As we talk about different types of evidence, there are a number of different things that we can do. Next slide, please. We can look at performance measurement, which is what we will focus on today, which helps us to understand what level of performance is achieved. So it's really counting, sorry, previous slide. It's really counting the amount of, thank you, the amount of things that we're doing, how much of something are we doing, how much change have we had. That is related to and serves as a nice foundation for program evaluation, which helps us to build on that and explain why we're seeing the results that we're seeing. Performance measurement primarily focuses on a particular program and what it's doing, where evaluation has a comparative element to it. It may be, may be comparing one program to another, or it may be comparing the time before a program started to the time after a program started, but there's a comparative element that helps us to understand why we're seeing the performance results that we're seeing. And when we add those two together, they can help us with performance management, which is really that next step of taking the information that we have from our performance measurement and our program evaluation and using that to better manage our resources, be it staff, be it money, be it facilities, any types of materials, but turning those data into decisions, helping to inform policy, inform funding decisions, and things like that. And logic models were mentioned earlier and will be mentioned again. They are one of our best tools for helping us for performance management. They build a foundation for performance measurement. They help us to shape and guide our evaluations, and they help other people to understand our programs so as we tell them what our programs are achieving, how individuals, families, communities, and organizations are different and better as a result of our program, we can always point back to the logic model to show the theory behind why we're doing what we're doing to get the results that we're looking for. The next slide focuses more on performance measurement itself and explains that performance measurement is not exhaustive. It really is a temperature reading. It tells us what, what is happening, how much are we doing, and what changes are we, see, what we seeing. It's directly related to the stated program goals and objectives. And I wanna highlight the idea of stated program goals because that is the first place to look to figure out what it is you wanna measure as a performance measure. And I'll give a examples of that as we go forward in the presentation. Performance measurement, bullet number three, measures progress of the activities quantitatively. So while qualitative data and qualitative information are extremely important for understanding how our programs work, why our programs work, understanding the nature of our programs, for performance measurement, we focus on quantitative numeric data. And as I said, it provides a temperature reading, a quick, reliable gauge of the selected results. The next slide provides some more definitions. If you think about performance measurement, it can measure a number of different things. It can measure the types or levels of program activities that are conducted, the process of implementing the program itself. Performance measures can also look at the direct products and services as a result of those activities, which we call outputs. And we can have outcome performance measures as well. Those are the ones that look at the so what, the results of our activities. Why are we doing our activities? There's some situation, some environment, some context, something that we wanna make better or maybe a bad thing that we want to reduce. Those are the outcomes, the results, the progress towards the actual goals, the so what. Performance measurement is also ongoing monitoring and reporting of those program accomplishments. And again, bring up the word towards progress towards pre-established goals. 
And so it's a temperature reading. It doesn't tell us all the why and all of the detail of what the program is doing, but it's ongoing monitoring in some regular time frame, be it monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, annually, whatever makes sense or may be required by your funder, but it's a regular temperature reading. And it's important to remember it doesn't need to measure everything about a program, but just those important actionable areas that really are the crux of what your program is doing that you can then use to determine is it going in the direction that it should, is your program going to meet the goals that have been stated for that program. The next slide has a few more definitions. It can be difficult sometimes to discern between outputs and outcomes, but it's very important to discern between those two things. Many programs measure outputs. Outputs are the first thing generally that you can measure. That's the amount of activity that you are doing. And so, for example, if your activity is providing a number of services, then the number of people served or the number of hours of service that are provided would be an output. If your program is providing training, then the number of people trained or number of hours of training provided might be a good measure of how much of that activity of tr training are we actually providing. If your program is developing a training, then the amount of educational materials provided might be a good output. So if you think about literally what is the program doing, and then you imagine somebody coming and asking you, well, how can you prove that you're doing this thing? And then you would say, well, we trained this number of people. We serve this number of people. Those are your outputs. Conversely, outcomes or impacts are the changes or benefits that result from those activities, but they're the changes in people, communities, families, organizations. It's something is different now. So it's not a count of what you did. Those are your outputs, but it's a measurement of how doing that thing changed someone or something's situation and context. And it's important to think about outcomes as sequential because normally we would have certain things that change first, but then you need to have certain changes to have later changes and later changes. Many of the things that we're trying to do are complicated and there are a lot of steps and stages and elements to them. So we may have sequential outcomes that we look at to see are we going in the right direction before we get to that final outcome that we may be looking for. And sequential outcomes and how to sequence our outcomes will come up. We have an exercise on that later in the conversation. But when we think about sequencing our outcomes, typically we start with short-term outcomes or leading outcomes. Um, and those are the changes that would be most closely associated with the activities. If we have the number of outputs, we count the amount of activity we have, then we expect some change very soon thereafter. So the short-term or leading outcomes are the first thing that we would notice as being different as a result of our programs. Then we have long-term outcomes, and those are next. So if we are realizing the short-term outcomes, then we would expect some more change later on down the road. Sometimes time has to pass or other things have to fit into sequence, but then there would be another series of changes later on, and those might be the long-term outcomes. And finally, we have the impacts or lagging outcomes, and those are the results thought to follow, follow on from there. And those really typically are the opposite of the goal that we have, so or a reflection of the goal that we have, the ultimate outcome that we're looking for, the ultimate impact of the program that we're looking for. So as we're all, I'm sure, very much aware then and very um, expert in determining outputs versus outcomes, can we go to the next slide and I'll go over a quiz where you all will get a chance to demonstrate your knowledge. We have a number of different things here, and I want you to tell me, we'll have a poll come up in just a moment, which ones of these are outcomes? So thinking about the definition of outputs as direct counts of level of activity versus outcomes, which are the so what, the changes that we would expect to see as a result of these activities, 
the results, which ones of these are outcomes? The number and percentage of staff trained to identify risk factors and support decision making through weighted factors, number and percent of people assessed using a post-investigation risk assessment tool, number and percent of new services available, number of new state and local APS policies and protocols, improve rates of consistency in APS practice across the states. So now we'll go to the quiz and you can vote for which ones are outcomes. So select as many as you want in terms of them being outcomes. Andrew, do you want to add anything about the poll? Um, no, just that we've launched it. So it should be up on your screen right now. All you have to do is click directly on your screen and you can choose more than one answer for this particular poll. We're going to leave it up for just a few seconds to give everybody a chance to make their choices. We still have some people selecting. So we'll leave it up for probably another 30 seconds. Um, again, you can click and directly on the screen. A, oh, go ahead, Susan. I'll give a hint. You should select. You should select more than one. Don't select all of them, but there is more than one outcome in this list. So it's not a single multiple choice. It's a multiple multiple choice um, question. So we'll give it about 10 more seconds, and then we will close the poll out, and I'll display the results of the poll so that everybody can take a look at that. It looks like. People are wrapping up, so I think at this point we'll close the poll out and I will share the results. Um, this will show the different votes that you'll see there. It looks like 27% of people selected the first one, 9% the second, 32% the third, 27% the fourth, and then the 95% for the very last one. So, um, Okay. And so I will start with the last one because almost everyone got that one right. So improving rates of consistency in APS practice across the states, the first clue that this is an outcome is that it has a value attached to it. We're specifying that we're looking for improved rates. So that directionality is many times a hint that something is an outcome. But also, if we look back to the funding opportunity announcements that you all responded to, we see that these words in those funding opportunity announcements follow directly after such as to. And those three words imply that we're conducting some activity to have the result of improving consistency. So we're doing something with the goal, such as to, improve rates of consistency. So that last one is definitely an outcome. I'll go back up to the top now. And the first one is actually an output. The number and percent of staff trained to identify risk factors and support decision making through weighted factors is an output because it relates to a training activity. So if we're training people, then the number of staff trained is an output. The goal of the grant is not to have trained staff as an endpoint, but rather to have those staff trained to gain new knowledge, awareness, or perspective, and then use that to work differently and have a different result for those served. By adding in the extra text about what they're trained to do, that could confuse people that it's an outcome, but this is in fact counting the number of people that you have trained is actually an output assuming that your activity is to train people. The second one, which almost everyone also got right, is also an output. The number and percent of people assessed using a post-investigation risk assessment tool is similar to the previous choice, and it's an output because if the activity is to implement a new assessment tool, then the number of people assessed using that tool is a way to measure whether or not or the extent to which it's being implemented. The outcome is the reason that you would use the tool, which might be to improve information about clients, to better match level of service to level of risk, or to reduce risk for those that you serve. So the number and percent assessed is an output. And then the next one, the number and percent of new services available is actually a goal of the Legal Services Enhancement Grants. And because it's a goal, that makes it an outcome. 
That goal is to promote enhancements, including innovations to legal assistance services, practices, partnerships, capabilities, consistent with ACL's mission and the Older Americans Act. It's also a goal of the Enhancement for State APS Services grants. That goal is strengthening state adult protective services systems statewide to include innovations, improvements in practice, services, and data collection and reporting. So based on the theory that we want to improve or enhance services, the increase in new services is an outcome. The remaining option is again an output, the number of new state and APS local policies and protocols. But this one is a bit trickier. So if you got this one wrong, absolutely do not feel bad. The way that I was thinking about it, and this is where involving stakeholders and conversation about this process is really important, but the way I was thinking about it was, for our purposes, if you fund an activity of implementing new policies and practices, then this is an output that should lead to the goal under the APS Enhancement Grant of improved case documentation or under the Legal Services Enhancement Grant of enhancing the effectiveness and efficiency of legal assistance programs and networks that include Older American Act funded legal assistance providers. But if your activity is improved communication among APS or legal service providers, the output would be the number of meetings or amount of coordination, and then we could tweak this to be an outcome of improved state and local policies and protocols. So that one is a little bit tricky, and I included it to show that this is somewhat of an art and not entirely a science. You have to know your program, what the goals are, what your activities are, to know exactly where to place the various different activities, outputs, and outcomes. So that one really could be either if you interpreted it the first way that I said it would be an output, or the second way it would be an outcome. Are there any questions before we move on to some specific examples using the funding opportunity announcements or FOAs that you responded to? Looks like there is one question, Susan, that popped up just a little bit ago. You mentioned that logic models are one of the best tools for performance measurement. If we want to learn more, what other tools are available? Okay. At the end of the slide deck, there are a number of resources that cover a lot of these different things, including logic models, performance measures, developing them, defining them, that kind of thing. So hopefully you'll be able to find something that will answer your questions using those resources. If not, you can always contact one of us or your grant officer, and I'd be happy to provide additional tools. Great. Thank you. That's the only question we okay. have right now. If there are no other questions, we can go to the next slide. Okay. So that shows the answers. So then the next slide starts us to talk about the specific funding opportunity announcements that you all responded to. We're going to start with the grants to enhance state adult protective services from fiscal, federal fiscal year 2019. And we turn here because the earlier definition of performance measures stressed that performance measurement is directly related to the stated program goals and objectives of the funding opportunity announcement, or FOA, as we call them. And those funding opportunity announcements are a great source of program goals, of defining those goals. So if we're going to start to develop performance measures, we need to look at the goals of the program and the FOAs really tell us what is the purpose of this funding. They, they specifically spell it out. The next slide starts to get into that particular APS enhancement grant, and we will turn to the legal services enhancement grants after, this, after these examples. But looking at this particular FOA, the Grants for Enhanced State Adult Protective Services, it says specifically that purposes of this grant are to strengthen state adult protective services systems, so that's an outcome, improve the state's infrastructure for providing APS services and improvements in APS intake, investigation, post-investigation, and quality assurance processes, and improve the state's ability to document and report APS case, client, perpetrator characteristics, and services 
in a manner consistent with the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, or NAMERS. So we have an overarching goal of strengthening state APS systems, and then we specify that a little bit more by talking about strengthening them through strengthening and improving state infrastructure, as well as state ability to document and report on case variables, information that would go into the NAMERS system. The next slide shows some further specification, and this information comes from pages four and five of the FOA, and it has seven additional areas that the grant wants people to work on. So it says ACL invites applications that seek to achieve one or more of these seven areas. So that provides a little more specificity for specifically what are the goals of this funding. So if we take number two, improve intake assessment, screening, and investigation of reports of adult maltreatment, and dig into that a little more closely, I'll go through an example of how you would pull out the specific things that would go into a logic model and that then you would use for your performance measures. So the next slide focuses on just that area number two. And it has the original language, the overarching efforts to improve the state's APS intake, assessment, screening, and investigation of reports of adult maltreatment, such as to. Such as to is a really important note because that's telling you we're doing this thing, this effort to reach these goals, implementing existing valid, reliable tools for client assessment and improving rates of consistency and APS practice across the state. So taking all of that information that we've looked at so far, we can go to the next slide and see what this really means. So I've talked us through it, but I like colors. I find it easier to remember, to visualize, to really place these things if we color code them a little bit. And so if we move these puzzle pieces around, slide number eight looked at the overarching goals of the program, and then slide 10 gave us a little more detail about it. So I highlighted the outcomes and impacts in the orange color. The green is actually an activity because it talks about implementing existing valid, reliable tools. So implementing something is actually an activity. And then we have another outcome of improved rates of consistency in the slightly brighter orange color. So once we look at the FOA, we pull out the goals, which are outcomes, and we pull out any activities that are specified, we can start to think about how to put them into a logic model. The next slide shows one example of a logic model. This was an example that was in the APS Enhancement Grants FOA, so just as an example, and it's very small on the screen. We won't go into the details of what's written here, other than to focus a little bit on those headers, that you want to have some contextual factors and assumptions to explain the program and the assumptions that it's based on. You would many times also take note of the inputs or resources that you use to implement the program, such as funding, such as staffing, any materials, anything like that. And then you get into the activities. What are you gonna do with these dollars? the outputs, which are direct measures of those activities, how much of those activities are you doing, then you get into your short, your outcomes, short and long-term, and your impacts. We're gonna focus just on the right-hand side of that logic model as we go forward. So on the next slide, I've just pulled out those right-hand columns and pulled out the headers, and so we're moving the text directly from the FOA and putting them into these categories in the logic model. So the materials that we looked at from the FOA before highlighted the activity of implementing existing valid and reliable tools, so that's something that you do, an activity, to get us to improved rates of consistency and APS practice across the state, to further get us to improving the state's infrastructure for providing APS service and improvements in the APS intake, investigation, post-investigation, and quality assurance processes. 
So we start to see how these things fit together, and we also start to see the sequencing of the outcomes. They're not all equal. Certain things you expect to happen first. If we go to the next slide, it points out that there's something missing. We have no outputs at this point, and you were very good at looking at what are outputs compared to outcomes. So of course you want to know, well, where are the outputs here? So we will go to the next slide, and I have another quiz for you. As outputs are direct measures of activities, and the activity that we have that we have under discussion at this moment is implementing existing valid and reliable tools for client assessment, which is the most appropriate output? And so this is a select only one. One is the most appropriate output for this particular activity. Andrew, can you bring up the poll? Certainly, I will launch that right now and it is up on your on the attendee screen. So just click on whatever you feel like is the most appropriate answer. Again, this is a single answer question, not a multiple answer question. Um, so you can only select one of these. Um, we will leave it up for just a little bit, give people a chance to read it again and respond. We have a few votes coming in. And I think we'll give it about 15 or so more seconds, give people a chance to respond. About 41% have voted thus far. And in about 10 more seconds, we will close it out. All right, so I will close that poll now and share the results with everybody, which you should be able to see on your screen. Um, the vast majority voted for the second option, number of clients assessed using a valid, reliable tool. And that would mean that the vast majority of people are correct. So I think that that is an excellent outcome for what we're doing so far. So the answer is B, the number of clients assessed using a valid and reliable tool. A reflects the outcome. So if we add the implied value word of increasing to the number of clients reliably assessed as being at risk, then that really is an outcome. That if we're implementing valid tools, we're hoping that the result of that will be that people will be more reliably assessed. The word reliably is also a hint that this might be an outcome because it shows a value, that we're not just looking for people who are assessed, the number of people assessed, but the number of people that are reliably assessed. So that makes it an outcome. C is an output, but not for this activity. C would be a better output for training individuals. So if we have an activity about training people about reliable tools, training people about how to implement them properly, then the number and the staff trained to use the tools would be a good output. So it is an output, but not for this particular activity. So B is the answer here. Before we move on, because this is difficult to do, are there any questions about this in particular? And never fear, there will be more chances to determine if something is an output or an outcome. And just as a reminder to everyone, you can type your questions at any time. You don't have to wait for us to pause. So um, if you have questions as we move along, feel free to type them in. We'll relay them later. But right now, we don't have any questions about this. No. Okay. Then we can go back to the slides, and I will slide that output into the logic model that we are developing. So if we look at this logic model, what we have is an organization, a grantee, is implementing existing valid and reliable tools for client assessment. We know that we're doing that by counting the number of clients that we are assessing using valid and reliable tools. If we do that at a large enough rate, enough of the clients are assessed using these valid and reliable tools, then we would expect to improve rates of consistency and APS practice across the state and if we improve rates of consistency, then we would expect to improve the state's infrastructure for providing APS services, improvements, et cetera. And that's really how the logic model works. It shows the logic of what we're doing as the activity to what we expect to happen 
in the outcomes and impact. Let's do another example. If we can go to the next slide. So from that list of seven focus areas, if you will, number one specified efforts to use technology and data to expand the state's APS program's participation in NAMERS data collection and improve the quality of data collected by local APS agencies and their ability to report reliable and valid data to the state APS program. And so why the bottom, the two bullets are orange, is that indicates that they are outcomes. And part of how we can know that those are outcomes is we're doing something using technology and data to. To implies to do something for a result. And so we do this thing, this using technology and data, in order to expand the state's program and improve the quality of data. So things that come after that type of a sentence structure are usually the outcomes. But I do have a problem with using use technology and data as an activity because it's very, very broad. If we can go to the next slide, I show a way that you may want to tweak that language that came directly from the FOA to make it more of an activity that you might actually be doing a more specified activity within your grant program. Because as I said, using technology and data is so broad. It could be so many different things. So I've specified it here and you may specify it differently as providing more technology and data supports. And so if you're working in this area, your, your activity may be slightly different, but even if it is, the process for identifying the pieces of the logic model will still be the same. And remember, the FOA, the Funding Opportunity Announcement, is not written for your specific grant award, so you may need to tweak the language a bit to better reflect your specific activities and outcomes. But it is best to stay as close as possible to the language of the FOA because that language reflects your, the goals of your funder, the goals your funder is trying to achieve, and the language that your funder chose to express those goals. And so don't make it hard for your funder to see how what you're proposing in your application and what you're reporting in your required reports will help that funder funding agency to meet its own predefined goals. So reflecting back the language of the FOA as much as makes sense is a good practice because then your funder can very easily, very quickly see, yes, these activities, this application does help us to meet our goals as an agency. So then they're more likely to fund you, to understand your reports, things like that but that doesn't mean that you can't change the wording just a little bit. If we go to the next slide, then we pull the pieces from the various slides. So going back to the original slide eight, which had the overarching goals of the funding, and then going to slide 20, which has the example from the activity or the focus area number one, we see that we have some impacts in the darker orange on slide eight, the same ones that we had before. We have an activity on slide 20 in green, and then some shorter term outcomes in the brighter orange from slide 20. If we pick up that language and put it into a logic model, we get to the next slide. And that shows the information placed in the logic model. The green activity goes in that column. The two brighter orange outcomes go in that that one column there, and then the impact is the darker rust color, darker orange, which goes in that final right-hand column. But the question remains again, what about outputs? Next slide. So think for a moment about what some outputs might be for this particular activity. And we have another quiz, another opportunity to identify the best, most appropriate output for this activity. The next slide shows that question. So again, outputs are a direct measure of activities. And I have said this several times and I will keep saying it because many times when it comes to putting together your own logic model, it's easy to forget that key element to it. And many times things that are outcomes, the changes that we expect to see in people, families, communities, and organizations end up in the output column. 
and counts of the activities can sometimes end up in the outcome column. And that then makes it harder for us to think about what are appropriate performance measures, what's going to be most convincing to funders and stakeholders of a program. So outputs are direct measures of activities. Our activity that we're talking about now is providing more technology and data supports. So which one is the most appropriate output? The number of new data elements reported through NAMERS, increase in data quality, number of state reports created using new technologies, or number of staff accessing technology supports. Andrew, can we go to the quiz? Certainly, I will launch that right now. And so once again, it's up on your screen to vote. And folks are already jumping right in and voting. Um, we'll leave it up for a little while and give everybody a chance. Again, this is a type of poll like the last one. There's only, you can only choose one. I do like that confidence. <laughs> there is a confidence for this one. So, um, yeah, so we'll leave it up for another few seconds, give everybody a chance to digest it and pick what they think is the most appropriate output. And we'll leave it up for about 10 more seconds. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to close that poll out now and display the results on the screen. Um, as you can see, most people chose the final option, number of staff accessing technology support. That's 72%. And again, most people are correct. Excellent. And so I will go through the thinking for each of these. A is an output, but not for this activity it would be better as an output for an activity related to collecting additional information. So A is an output, but not as appropriate for this activity as some of the other ones. B, which no one selected, because everyone is a genius, is an outcome. So it's not an output at any, of any sort, so that's excellent. It's an outcome because we expect that more support will increase data quality. So the support Counting the increases in data quality is not a count of the amount of support provided, but it's a result, an outcome of providing more technology and data supports. So B is an outcome. C is an outcome if we follow the logic that providing the supports will increase the number of staff that are able to use the technology in order to create better, different, or more efficient reports. So in the, the order, it, so the logic is that what leads us to the conclusion that C is an outcome. So thinking about that sequential logic. Also, changes in behavior, such as the actual use of the technology for the reports, signals that it is probably an outcome. So the answer is D. The number of staff accessing technology supports would be a good output, a good measure of the provision of more technology and data supports. So that is the best output for this particular activity, given the choices that you had. So thank you for playing along with us. The next slide, again, shows you how it all fits into the logic model. So we provide more technologies and supports. We know how much we've provided. One way to measure that would be the number of staff accessing the technology supports. If staff are accessing the technology supports, then we would expect that they would expand the state APS program's particip participation in the NAMERS data collection and improve the quality of the data collection, which ultimately then takes us to improving the state's ability to document and report APS case and client perpetrator characteristics and services in a manner consistent with namers. Before we leave the APS enhancement grants, we'll go to the next slide because there are a few other things that you should measure. So in addition to measuring selected outputs and selected outcomes, you also should think about what contextual factors or what assumptions and parameters about the program you may want to measure. And many times these are also in the funding opportunity announcement, the FOA. So this particular FOA, the Enhanced State Adult Protective Services, has several things, but I pulled out a couple of them here. And so it's, the funding is to 
affect the state's ability to document and report APS case, client, and perpetrator characteristics and services, the parameter is in a manner that is consistent with the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System. So we would want to have some measure of fidelity to NAMERS standards or requirements because it's not, the funding isn't just to increase or change ability to document in any old way, it's within the manner that fits with, that is consistent with NAMERS. So that's something you also may want to measure if you're working in this area. What is the fidelity to the measures, the quality, the data related to NAMERS standards and definitions? Another parameter that is in the funding opportunity announcement is that the funds should promote innovations and improvements in state APS practices, services, and data collections that are consistent with ACL's mission and incorporate consumer-directed approaches. So again, you may want to measure the extent to which the innovations and improvements that you may be affecting related to practice, service, and data collection are consistent with and incorporate a consumer-directed approach. Because you can imagine there may be ways to have innovative programs and services that are not consumer directed. And then that would not really be fulfilling the spirit of this funding. It should be done within the parameter, within the constraint of being consistent with ACL's mission and incorporating a consumer directed approach. So there may be some other things that are not exactly your performance measures your outputs and outcomes that you also want to measure to make sure that what you are measuring, what you are doing is fitting with the spirit of the funding opportunity announcement. Can we go to the next slide? So as not to leave anyone out, we will now turn to the funding opportunity announcements that others of you have replied to, which is the legal assistance enhancement program. And so we will do a similar exercise for your grant so that you have something that maybe is more familiar to you, but the process is still the same process of how you identify the activities, how you identify the outcomes and the impacts, and how you come up with what the outputs may be. So if we can turn to the next slide. Legal Assistance Enhancement Program the stated purpose is to strengthen and enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of legal assistance programs serving older Americans. So the purpose, the goal that you would need to measure in some fashion is stated very clearly in the funding opportunity announcement. Another goal is that legal assistance providers enable older Americans to assert their rights and remove barriers to economic and personal independence and self-determination. So again, here's an outcome that should come out of this funding. And remember, for outcomes, we're looking at what we expect to be different. So there has to be some words such as improving or reducing or strengthening, enhancing. Those types of words can really point us to where the outcomes and the impacts are for our logic model and then for developing our performance measures. If we can go to the next slide, then we can look at a little bit more text that's in that funding opportunity announcement. It goes on to say that the funds are to help to offer legal assistance stakeholders the opportunity to identify and implement enhancements to legal assistance programs and identification and implementation are verbs, so those become activities. And the words that will indicates that what comes after that is an outcome. So if we identify and implement enhancements to legal assistance programs, those will result in, hopefully, improvements in the effectiveness and efficiency of services. The FOA also talks about ACL intends that the grant program will demonstrate ways in which a greater number of eligible clients may be served. So having more clients served, more eligible clients served, is an outcome of enhancing the legal assistance providers provision and process. 
And we talked a little bit at the end of the example related to the APS enhancement grants about parameters and about um, constraints. So if we go to the next slide, we have another quiz. ACL intends that this grant program will demonstrate ways in which the greater number of eligible clients may be served to redress the legal issues prioritized within the Older Americans Act, fulfilling intentions articulated by the Older Americans Act of securing independence and the rights of older Americans. So that is a mouthful. And if we're thinking that the outcome is having a greater number of eligible clients being served to redress legal issues prioritized within the Older Americans Act, given all that we've talked about up until this point, and this is a little tricky, what is the dark red italicized, italicized text? Redressing legal issues prioritized within the Older Americans Act. Is that an activity, an output, an outcome, an impact, or an assumption? And so I'll go to the poll, Andrew, if we may. Yep, we will launch that right now and give you a chance to vote. Um, again, this is just a single question selection. Um, it looks like folks are voting, so we'll leave it up for just a minute. We have about half of the people who voted thus far. And I think we'll leave it open for another 15 seconds or so. Give it just about five more seconds. All right, I'm going to close that poll out and display the results for everybody. And it looks like 53% voted for impact, followed by 32% for activity. Okay. And there are a couple of different ways to look at it, but I think we should think about this as an assumption. And I, I mentioned that this was very tricky because the text, redressing legal issues prioritized within the Older Americans Act, specifies who we count when we count the number of clients served. And so I can see how it could be thought of as an outcome or an impact because we want to increase the number of people who have redress for the legal issues prioritized in the Older Americans Act. But if we are counting the number of people served, having that information about redressing the legal issues prioritized in the Older Americans Act actually tells us who to count for the outcome of the greater number of clients served. So it specifies, it offers parameters and limitations into who we're supposed to serve, who we're supposed to count for serving this greater number. So it is a little confusing. It is not an activity because the activity is not redressing the issues per se. If somebody has that as an activity, then that would be a different way to look at it, and then we would put it in a very different place in the logic model. But for our purposes, I'd like us to think about this as an assumption. So if we can go back to the slides, we'll talk a little bit more about assumptions. And assumptions are probably the trickiest thing because they help us to understand the parameters within which we're operating, within which we're supposed to focus our efforts and focus our measurement. And so they can be tied very closely to activities. It can specify the activities or to outcomes or impacts. So they are sort of the trickiest thing. If we look at this slide, though, we see that there's more information in the FOA for the Legal Assistance Enhancement Program. And it very conveniently lists a number of activities such as outreach, intake, and I added the word in brackets, implement intake strategies, because it focuses on the strategies, not on the intaking activity itself, but implementing strategies related to intake. Delivery is another activity, and partnerships, essential partnerships, and I put in the word building, because the partnerships themselves are not an activity, but building, or you may in your award be strengthening, maintaining, or doing some other activity other than building your partnerships, but there would have to be a verb there. 
but doing something with the partnerships is probably an activity for our purposes. And this text also tells us why we should do these things, the outcomes that we want to achieve from doing these things, and those are shown in the, the bright orange. And so if we do outreach to individuals, the first bullet, we want them to be educated on the broader aging network about the problems experienced by this population. If we implement intake strategies, it is to enable assistance providers to identify and accept eligible clients. And so we see the activity and then we see why we're doing the activity. And then we do have a few other in red, red italics of the assumptions. So as we deliver the services, we want to have more effective delivery, that's the orange, and that delivery is within these parameters. It includes selecting the AAAs that are best able to provide the services, ongoing substantive skills training and professional development, and culturally competent approaches. That is part of effective delivery. And so you could measure them as part of your outcomes because they're part of the definition of effective delivery, but I've categorized them here as an assumption because they do help to define the outcome of effective delivery. It's within these three parameters. But again, the assumptions are a little bit slippery how you use them, but they're important to pay attention to because you probably want to, in most cases, monitor or track in some way that you are meeting and living within, operating within these parameters, these limitations. The next slide shows a few other considerations that were listed in the Legal Assistance Enhancement Program FOA. And so these programs have to operate within the constraint, if you will, of serving older Americans with social or economic need, that's who are eligible clients, with a specific focus on those who are isolated by reason of geography, language, cultural, or residential setting. So as you're counting possibly serving greater numbers of clients in the legal areas that are specified, you also want to make sure that you're serving those with the most need. So that social economic need or a focus on specific isolation factors. In addition, the Older American Act mandates that legal assistance for the eligible clients be accessible, which is defined as easy to locate and use, delivered by knowledgeable, well-trained legal assistance providers. So knowing that you're providing a lot of service or you're serving a lot of clients is really only meeting the spirit of the grant if those services are accessible and provided by knowledgeable, well-trained legal assistance providers. So you want to have some measure that, yes, the services that we're providing, the services that clients are receiving meet these characteristics in that middle bullet. And then the third bullet, legal assistance providers must be able to. And so as we think about, well, who's a legal service provider that we should be funding, we should be measuring, we should be counting towards our counts of who's serving the services are provided, those providers must be able to deliver their services in the principal language spoken by their older clients in areas where a significant number of such clients do not speak English as their principal language. So looking at the extent to which the language of providers matches the language of the community is also going to be important for making sure that we are providing the best services, the most effective services possible, with effective service provision being an outcome. And these are assumptions because they help to define what are effective services, who are the clients that we're supposed to be focused on. Can we go to the next slide? And here's another time for questions because we're going to move into talking about logic models. We've done a couple of examples of logic models, but I want to speak in a moment more specifically about how you use a logic model and go back to the, the topic earlier of sequencing the outcomes. But before we move on to that, are there any questions about identifying activities, outcomes, and assumptions from your funding opportunity announcements, general questions um, that you have before we move on? 
And this is ADK Bart. Uh, now is the time to type your questions into the question box if you have any. We do have one question that comes from much earlier in your presentation, Susan. Um, how do you measure impacts or longer term outcomes when APS is often a short term intervention program? So I think this comes down mm -hmm. to more client outcomes because APS will often not keep a case open for a long period of time. Um, how do you get to those long-term goals or, or measure those long-term um, impacts? Mm -hmm. That is an excellent question. And there are a couple of answers. So depending on your specific situation, one or more of these answers will probably help you. But in thinking about measuring in general, impacts or longer term outcomes, we don't always have to measure them. If we have a strong logic as to why if we do this, some activity and we're starting to see the shorter term outcomes and evidence has shown us there is a strong literature related to knowledge in the field, evidence that if we have the shorter term outcomes, then that does lead directly to those longer term outcomes, then it may be sufficient to measure the shorter term outcomes. We should always measure some outcomes, but we may not always have to measure the longest outcomes or the impacts. Great. If we are working with a program that may not be evidence-based and may not have that strong logical proven scientifically and rigorously proven connection between the shorter term outcomes and the longer term outcomes, then we may need to redefine what those impacts are. And so while we want to improve the independence of older adults living in the community to live in a place and in a way that is safe and free from abuse, neglect, and exploitation, if the goal of our program is to improve the delivery of APS services and make them more efficient, then we may really be limited to measuring the efficiency of the program and with the assumption then, the implicit assumption that a more efficient program, if it doesn't affect quality, if we can maintain or increase quality while improving the efficiency, then we would still have the same outcomes for individuals, then you may need to think about what are your specific impacts for your program. And so the program may be working on system change, which then we believe will take us to consumer and client change. But for the purpose of this particular funding opportunity, it may be a closer in outcome. And so that's where the sequencing comes in and that kind of thing. Are there gotcha. any other questions before we move on? Um, there is another question from earlier. Um, that, is there any role that you see for qualitative data in performance management? I know you mentioned that you know quantitative data is what we're mm -hmm. after, but what role do you see for a qualitative data? In performance management, absolutely. Qualitative data is very important for understanding the context. But when we talk about performance measurement, that piece of evidence that contributes to performance management and that can serve as a foundation for evaluation. When we talk about performance measurement specifically, because it is a temperature reading, we're only measuring a handful of things, not strictly a handful, you know, it might be two, it might be 10, but some small number of things about a program, the outputs and the outcomes that really tell us, yes, we're going in the right direction. They should be relatively easy to collect information for. They should be things that can be routinely collected on some sort of a schedule, be it weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, something like that. So performance measures should be quantitative for those reasons. But when we think about other forms of evidence, qualitative information is extremely important for those other forms of evidence and for informing our performance management, because it can give us a lot of insight into why something works the way that it does, how people are experiencing the services that they're receiving, those kinds of things. That's really important for performance management, but performance measurement should in almost every case be quantitative. Makes perfect sense. Thank you, that's all the questions we have right now. Okay.
then we'll go to the next slide and that takes us into one of what I think are the most helpful tools for any of this type of stuff is the logic model. So you will see in a few slides why I like the logic model so much and why you should as well. It can help us to organize our thinking about the logical connections between what we're doing and the outcomes and impacts that we expect. In addition to that, it's also a good way to communicate about a program and for our purpose to build the foundation for performance measurement as the outputs and outcomes of what we need to measure are pretty much listed in the logic model. If we do the work to develop a logic model to identify the activities and then come up with specific outputs for those activities and to identify the outcomes and impacts, then we know in there somewhere is where our performance measures are going to be. So it gives us a lot of work for that. But then also, once we have a logic model, it should be an easy to understand graphical representation of the theory of why what we're going to do is going to take us to the results, the so what that we're looking for. And so as you talk to funders, as you talk to stakeholders, as you talk to staff and clients, whoever is most relevant, new staff that may be coming into the program, you can show them this and very quickly they can get at least an overview understanding of what your program, what this funding or other funding is intended to do. So it's very good for communication. And honestly, the process of developing a logic model, if you bring stakeholders together to work on it, really starts to focus stakeholders to go in one direction. Because the conversation about well, what are our main activities? What are our assumptions and context? What are our inputs? And we haven't focused on those aspects today, but if people think, okay, what really are our outcomes that we're looking for? And do we have activities that are going to lead to these outcomes? Does this theory stand up? That process, those conversations really help to focus everybody going into one direction with the program so the program can be more successful. So the logic model is important, but honestly, the process of developing a logic model is very helpful in and of itself. Let's go to the next slide. And we showed a logic model or several slides ago that's in the FOA for the enhanced APS grants, those enhancement grants. But here's a simple way to think about a logic model. As I mentioned, it should be a plausible and sensible diagram of the sequences of causes. So it should be a graphic representation of the theory, the logic, underlying why you're doing what you're doing. And so we think about the inputs, the resources. So if you answer the question or finish the sentence in the left-hand box, we use these resources, which could be money, staff, it could be anything. What do you need to run the program? If you didn't have these ingredients, if you will, you wouldn't be able to run the program. Those are your inputs, those are your resources. We use these resources for these activities. Then you list out what are the activities that the program does. Does it train staff? Does it provide technology and data supports? What does the program actually do? What are the verbs, to put it simply? And we do those activities to produce these outputs. So what are the counts of those activities? And then the right-hand three boxes really are our so what, our outcomes. So we produce these outcomes so that customers, and just use that in a very broad sense, it can be organizations, it can be clients, it can be stakeholders, it can be communities, but so that some entity, some people of some sort are different in some way. And if they're different in some way, then that leads us to more changes, which lead us hopefully to our ultimate goal for the program. And if you remember back to slide 10, the definition of outputs and outcomes, the part about outcomes describing that programs typically have multiple sequential outcomes, which are sometimes called the outcome structure, we're going to talk about that for a moment so that you can start to think about, well, what comes first? If we have these resources to do these activities, we do enough of these activities as measured through our outputs, then we expect something to be different but usually there's a sequence to the changes that we are expecting. 
we can go to the next slide, we'll start to talk a little bit about structuring our outcomes and impacts. So on slide 32 earlier, we had these three outcomes and impacts. Improving the effectiveness and efficiency of services, greater number of eligible clients may be served, increasing Americans' assertion of their rights. And so we can think about it by saying, if we're able to, and we start on the left-hand side, if we're able to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of our service, then a greater number of eligible clients may be served, and then we increase older Americans' assertion of their rights. So we have to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of our service first. Once we have been able to achieve that outcome, we would expect to see a greater number of eligible clients being served. If we serve more eligible clients effectively and efficiently, then we would expect to see more older Americans asserting their rights under an APS framework. And so that's the sequence. Think about the logic of if we do this, then we will get that, which then will lead us to the third thing. That's the sequencing. The next slide has another example of sequencing. If we go back to the what is on slide 26, and so you can go back, you know, if you have the slides yourself later, but these three outcomes and impacts were on slide 26. So again, if we put it into a sentence format, if we're able to, starting on the left-hand side, if we're able to improve the quality of data collection by local APS agencies and improve the local APS agency's ability to report reliable and valid data to the state APS office, then we improve the state's ability to document and report APS case client perpetrator characteristics and services in a manner that's consistent with namers, and then we strengthen the state adult protective service system services system statewide. So if we do A, we get to B. If we are getting to B, then we can get to C. And part of why we look at the sequence is if we just measure the thing in the right-hand column, the final impact, if we're not getting towards it, we don't know why if we're not meeting our targets or our goals for how much we want to strengthen state adult protective service systems statewide we don't know did we not have did we not do one of the original steps one of, did we not meet one of the original outcomes so having a sequence of outcomes and not just having the ultimate impact can help us to know where our program is going right and maybe where our program is going wrong and it's more important when our program is going wrong because then we have to dissect where is the problem with it? Why are we not achieving the impact that we want? So having some intermediate outcomes, some shorter term outcomes, some sequential outcomes can help us to understand along the way. Also, as we think about impacts being in the long term, as one of the questions was um, asking about earlier, it may take us a long time to strengthen state adult protective service systems statewide. So, you know, in six months, in one year, in two years, we may want to know or at least going in the right direction. And that's where the sequence of outcomes also comes in handy. We may be able to measure much more quickly that we've improved the quality of data collection by local APS agencies in the left-hand column. And we have a theory that that then will help us to improve the ability to document, which then will strengthen the system statewide. So if we can measure some of those earlier things, we may be able to measure them earlier on and then do corrective actions if we need to, or apply for more funding or other things like that before we get to the ultimate impact, which can sometimes take many years. And funders wanna know before all those years are up, are you going in the right direction? And staff, and Administration will also want to know those questions. People can be disheartened if they don't believe that things are going in the right direction or there's no evidence one way or the other. So having sequential outcomes can be very helpful for a number of reasons. Thinking about sequential outcomes, we're going to go to the next slide, which has another example of a logic model. This was, this was something I believe that was sent to you and it, as an example. And it shows the impact 
in the rust-colored rectangle for improved outcomes of improving outcomes for individuals served by state APS. And the orange circles show shorter-term outcomes of enhancing assessment and monitoring to improve data collection. And so looking at those, what words, so type into the memo box, the question box, what words tell you that these out of the things written on in that upper blue box that these are outcomes or impacts? What words in those sentences sort of tell you that these are outcomes or impacts? All right, and if people would like to either type that in the chat box or in the question box, either one, we can relay them from there. Uh, one answer is enhance and improve. That would be the right answer. And someone else said it too, improve and enhance in the reverse order. So yeah, it looks like that's what mm -hmm. the, the answers are that are coming through. Yes, so that is exactly right. Those are the words that can help you to say, okay, these are probably outcomes because we're trying to change a condition in some way. So that's perfect. And so if you look at this logic model, you also see that in the right hand, white square with the yellow header that we have a list of possible outcomes under the header anticipated outcomes but these are not shown in sequential order so it will be up to you to know your own program and determine which outcomes you expect to come first which are again the leading indicators and which you expect to come later which are the lagging indicators so that's where the art as opposed to the science comes in you know the theory of your program you know what you're trying to do, you know the research, you know the literature, you know your state, you know your system, what changes do you expect to happen first, and then what changes do you expect to happen second, and that helps you to sequence your outcomes properly. The next slide is one example, a final example of sequencing. And so, there, these were three of the outcomes that were in that anticipated outcomes square. And if, as you look at things like this, it doesn't jump out at you or you start to get a little confused about what the order might be for your outcomes, one tip that works sometimes is knowledge, perception, and awareness are typically the first changes that you will see. When you teach somebody to do something, when you provide supports for technology and data, when you change an assessment process, things like that, mainly you will see changes in knowledge, perception, and awareness first. So that's usually your shortest term outcome. That's a direct result of your activities, not a count of your activities, those are outputs, but a result, a so what an outcome of your activity. So in this case, I pulled one of the outcomes from that anticipated outcomes cell. Providers will increase knowledge of perpetrator's relationship with the victim throughout the progression of the case. So if people know something different, then we expect changes in behaviors, procedures, or actions, things like that. So if providers increase their knowledge of the relationships, then the APS service providers in the middle cell will demonstrate that's a behavior, an increased ability to holistically assess the victim, and then that should lead us to the change in condition. The program will reduce its percentage of subsequent reports. So these three outcomes were in that anticipated outcome square. This may be a logical sequence for those outcomes. Again, you have to know your program to know what the sequence is, but this is one that demonstrates if you know something different, you can do something different to then affect the ultimate change that you're trying to affect. So that can help you to sequence. Now that we have very good ways of, and you all have demonstrated an increased knowledge of identifying what are activities, what are outputs, what are outcomes, and those kinds of things, Let's take it one step further. So what do we actually measure? So if we know that we want to increase, a de increase ability to holistically assess the victims, that's lovely, but literally what is the performance measure? What are we actually counting to do that? Let's go to the next slide and we'll start thinking about what is it that we're actually 
going to count as our performance data, our quantitative data. And so I don't necessarily expect for you to look at, read all the text in the outputs, but this comes from the logic model we looked at a couple of slides ago, and it has a list of outputs, and there are two basic categories of outputs here. One has to do with developing a model APS case management and data system that actually accurately reflects outcomes for persons served by the state's APS program, and another category of outcomes related to data collection. So on the whiteboard, I'd like you to start with number two, actually. How would you measure as an output the amount of data collection? And folks can type that into the chat box or they can um, put their answers in the question box. Not seeing, oh, here's an answer. There's no right or, okay. I and I promise there's not. There's no right or wrong answer. This is related to you and your programs. And I promise not to out anybody by mentioning names. <laughs> if that, that helps. <laughs> Someone did say repeat the question, please. So if you could repeat it one more time. So. Okay. So as we think about data collection as an output area, what would you actually measure? Like the number of what? What would the actual quantitative information be that you would measure to know that you are collecting data? Looks like one person said, compare data from the past years to the current data reporting period. Yes, you could count the number of data elements that you used to have compared to the number of data elements you have now. That would be great. Or you could look at the number of data elements that have a reduction in missing data compared, you know, previous to compared to now. So yes, that's exactly right. Certainly. And that really then would be your performance measure. There's a few and other so that's answers. That's how you turn these categories into measures. Yes, what are some other answers? A few other answers too. Number of namers, data elements. Somebody typed that as soon as you as soon as you mentioned that. Number of new fields completed. Um, yes. yes. Number of clients data was collected on and submitted for namers, the actual number of individuals that data was collected mm -hmm. on. Yes, those would all be great candidates for an output related to data collection, the amount of data collection that is being done. Those would be great outputs, absolutely. Is there anything else? Uh, it looks like that's it for now. Okay, but yes, those are all excellent answers. And so I also put in, number one, a model APS case management and data system that accurately reflects outcomes for persons served by state APS programs. And I won't ask you about how you would measure that, but I will ask you to just think about, we could make that a yes or no. Do we have a model system or do we not? And the outcome, output, sorry, output could just be, yes, we do. But that's not really actionable. That's not really helpful as a performance measure because once you have it, you have it. And so measuring that on a regular cycle of weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, it doesn't tell you anything new. There's no action to take based on that. So it's good to know that yes, you have a model system, but it's not a great performance measure. What might be a better performance measure and why I highlighted the word reflect is looking at fidelity looking at the degree to which this case management system and data, case management and data system that you have actually re accurately reflects the outcomes for persons. So your outputs could be related to that activity of reflecting well the actual outcomes for the persons in the system. So I'm not gonna ask you for how you would measure that, but just to think about as you look at that as an out output, Think about reflecting rather than just, do we have a model system or we don't have a model system? We're gonna to move to outcomes because they're a little less obvious sometimes for how you would turn those into performance measures. And so on this next slide, we have the anticipated outcomes and I selected one of them. Victims will actively participate in the development and progress towards a case, towards case plan goals. So if you could type into the comments or the question box, how would you measure that? What would your quantitative 
sensitive data be related to victims actively participating? So assuming more active participation, enhancement of the participation, you know, what that value is going to be, but how would you measure that? What would be a good performance measure for this outcome of act victims actively participating in the development and progress toward a case plan goal? And people can just type again in the question box or in the comment box. One comment was number of goals developed by the client. Mm -hmm. um, someone else said reduction of refusals of service. Certainly that's an issue in APS. Mm -hmm. um, number mm -hmm. of clients you signed off agreeing to each goal. So the number of um, clients that agreed mm -hmm. to their goals. Attendance at services was another one. Um, Mm -hmm. Create tracking system to identify victim participation, i.e. track when the victim participates like a check mark. was another comment. Okay, yeah. Those all sound like very good outcome performance measures for this particular outcome. And so you would have to decide what is feasible, what is not too burdensome for you to collect, what you might be able to integrate easily into your regular operations but those would be good ways to measure that particular outcome. So that's how we go from having an outcome in our logic model to having a specific outcome performance measure and specific quantitative data that we're collecting. So that was honestly really impressive to me that you could so quickly move from the one to the other. And I know you know your programs well, so I'm not surprised that they were good, but just how quickly you were able to do that was very wonderful. So on the next slide, we're about to go into a new topic slightly. So now you've defined your outputs, your outcomes and your impacts, and you've turned them into performance measures. Now what? So if we can go to the next slide. We're gonna talk a little bit about once you have your award, which you all have, what do you do? How can you best use some of this performance data and make sure that it's gonna suit what your funder is looking for? So one thing that you can do is, as we've discussed, review the outcomes from the FOA and propose and your proposal and revise them with your grant officer as needed. So you may need to add some value words, the words that you identified as showing that something's an outcome, enhance, improve. Sometimes it's reducing. Sometimes it's, you know, having less of something that's bad while many times it's enhancing or improving or increasing something that's good. But, you know, looking back at the FOA, looking back at your proposal, your application, and seeing, okay, have we really defined our logic model properly? Have we defined our outcomes properly? Are they sequenced properly? So going back and doing that, because a logic model and performance measures, honestly, shouldn't just be static. They should be living as you learn more about your program, as you learn more about what the funder needs, the reality on the ground, things like that. You should go back periodically and look at them. Once you have talked with your grant officer about the outputs and outcomes, what makes the most sense, jointly agree upon specific performance measures. Work with them to determine what data you are going to collect and report and how those data elements are defined. If we think about victims actively participating in the development and progress towards a case plan goal, what do we mean by actively participate? And some of you in your performance measures sort of define that. The number of, the number of refusals, the number of times that people show up for different services, things like that. So make sure that your definitions are okay with your funder and okay with your other stakeholders. Discuss criteria in a rating scale to assess overall grant performance. So you know what your performance measures are. You've agreed with your grant officer. Set some targets so that at the end of the grant period, you know what you've done. You know how many people you've trained, how many staff has, have accessed the technology supports. What number is going to be sufficient for your funder? What is your target number for those things? And for your outcomes, what degree of change are you really looking for to consider yourself successful? You could say one more person doing something is successful, but you should really think about a more nuanced number. You know, how much will you expand state program participation in NAMERS? 
Is it one variable or is it a 10% increase, a 50% increase? I mean, you know your program to know what that level of expansion should be, but think that through a little bit so you have targets. So at the end, you can say we did or we did not meet these well thought out, considered and nuanced targets. Think about reviewing the grantee baseline data with ACL. So earlier, somebody was mentioning we could compare what happened previously to what's happening now to look at the number of data elements that we may have added. And so look at that original baseline data that you may have collected before you started the program or start collect it right at the beginning of the program and make sure that you have what you need to then be able in the intermediate stages or at the end to say, we have enhanced, we know where we started, and now we can say we have improved, enhanced, or reduced, because you have that baseline number. Review your routine reporting with ACL. If you're running into problems, you're, you're overshooting your targets, you're undershooting your targets, you're having trouble getting some of the data you thought you would be able to get, maybe you need to change your performance measures because certain data are not available or too burdensome. So talk with ACL, your grant officer, about these things and use the logic model as a reference throughout the life of the program to keep focused. I have seen numerous times, and I'm sure others have as well, we have great data on a certain topic. It's quality data, it's complete data, there's not missing data, but if it's not relevant to the logic model, if it's not relevant to the stated, predetermined, predefined goals, it may be great data, but it may not be a great performance measure, and we shouldn't bow to the sort of pressure to use whatever data we have. We need to stay focused, and the logic model can help us to stay focused and not collect more than we need to and spend time collecting data that we don't need to collect. That is not efficient. But it's very easy when you see good data to want to include it somewhere. And you have to use your logic model to remind yourself and remind everybody else, no, this is what we're doing. This is what we're measuring. You may go back and change your logic model if you really find something useful that's new and different, but those should go hand in hand. Go to the next slide, please. In the closeout phase of your grant, you can pay close attention to your progress on performance. You have your baseline data, hopefully, and you've been reporting along the way and moving towards your targets. So then you can come up with a summary statement. What did you really achieve? How much enhancement, improvement, expansion were you able to do? And were there any other unintended consequences that may have been good or bad? Really, what has happened? Were you able to stick within those parameters and those assumptions to really increase services maybe for people that are isolated due to geography and really highlight that where you did some improvement for people isolated due to language, but really you shown very well, very brightly in serving people who are isolated due to geography. Highlight those things. And use the criteria and rating scale that you agreed upon in the beginning, the targets of how much enhancement, how much greater things should be, how many people you plan to serve, and go back and compare to that and see, did you meet the targets and the um, projections that you had? And be honest about that with your grant officer and with yourself to say, what could you have done better? What did you do really well? What lessons have you learned by going back to your original criteria and seeing where you ended up at the end? The next slide has a few recommendations. Always for this grant and for every grant, assure appropriate measure selection. You want actionable data data that's going to be able to tell you something about your program, something over which you have control so that you can improve your program or do more of what's working and less of what's not working. You need data in those areas, actionable data. You want to test and refine your measures over time to reduce potential unintended consequences. So for example, if you have a measure of serving a greater number of people, you don't want to push too hard for that and then not be serving those with the greatest economic need or those that are socially isolated, because you could push up the numbers of serving more people by serving the wrong people. And that is not in the spirit of this grant. And you can think about that with other grants as well. 
So you may need to minimize or refine your measures, or you may find that some measures are not actionable. So you may want to get rid of those measures because you're spending time collecting them and you're not able to do anything with them. The next bullet is developing a logic model. The more time you spend really working on a good logic model, bringing people together, working on that process, it is really worth it. And then the last bullet, ensured phased implementation. You need time to design your performance measures, to test them, and to revise them as you go along. So you need to build that time into your grant operations to make sure that you're not ultimately stuck with measures that you can't use, or that you're collecting too many things that aren't helpful, and that you really have valid and reliable data. So you need to test, you need to go back and revisit periodically and say, are these still the right measures? And they very well may be, but you want to explicitly do that to make sure that that is the case. So the last slide is a summary really of what I've been trying to talk about here today is you want to clearly articulate a vision of success for your grant program. By having a logic model, it says what you're trying to do and having targets and projections for your outputs and your outcomes really clearly defines what you're going to consider success for the grant program. You should use the performance measurement and other evidence to help your program to achieve success, to improve program management. You want to build performance measurement and evidence into each phase of the grant process. So thinking about as you're thinking about designing a program, what is the logical relationship between the outcomes? What is the logical relationship between the inputs or resources and the activities and the outcomes? And what are parameters, assumptions, or contextual factors that might help or hinder your project? So you want to build this process in the beginning, in the middle as you're really developing, as you're implementing it, and as you're closing out a project, going back and looking at those things, looking at those assumptions, putting, really documenting those lessons learned in these performance areas. And keep in mind that it is difficult to request more funding or to replicate your program if you're not able to show results. You may get a grant one time because it's a new, it's an innovative program, there's no prior knowledge of it, but if you go back to replicate it or to get more money for it, you should be, and hopefully will be asked, why should I give you money? What's the so what? What difference are you making? And if you have a clear logic model that you can show to funders, if you have performance measures and data that you can show, you're much more likely to get continued funding, to get continued support, and even for staff, line staff, to continue to give their all to a program if you can show them the work that they're doing, what's coming out of it on a holistic perspective. Because line staff may see what they're doing. They may see the individual lives they're touching. But when you aggregate that across a community, across a state, it really gives people a sense of pride and helps them to remain invested in the program, which helps with program success as well. So we'll close out in just a second. The last few slides, if you just want to click through them quickly, Andrew, those are the resources. So we tried to include resources for all sorts of different stuff. And so there's a question earlier about where to go for more information. Hopefully one of these resources will give you what you need. But if not, you can always contact one of us and we can find something maybe more specific to a particular question that you might have. And then the very last slide, rounds us back out to the beginning of with stronger evidence we can learn from and improve programs to help people to better serve the american people to better use taxpayer dollars and that really is the goal of all of this so before we close out completely are there any remaining questions or comments and if anyone has questions or comments just type them into the question box there is um one question that's outstanding right now do you have any recommendations for how often to revisit a logic model and your measures. And I think this might that be speaking to after, after even the grant phase, you know, if you continue to use it, how often should you revisit it? Mm -hmm. If you make a significant change to the program, be it who you're serving, how you're serving them, anything like that, adding new, significantly new programs or new program areas, 
you should revisit the logic model whenever you make what you would consider a significant change to your program. You should also, if you're not really making any significant changes, programs do drift, they do adapt, they do, maybe the population you're serving is changing, even though you're not changing the program necessarily. Um, probably every one to three years. It really depends on what changes are happening in your contextual factors and your assumptions, things like that. A quick tune-up every year can be helpful, but that may be more than you need, maybe every three years. But if you ever see a significant change in your inputs, your resources, the people you're serving, the types of issues that are coming up perhaps, then you're going to want to revisit your logic model. And there's one other question too. Who should be involved in the creation of the logic model? The whole project team plus the leaders, the board, clients, etc. My suggestion, and people will differ on this, so this is not a hard and fast rule. My suggestion, what I have seen to work well, is having a variety of the people that are implementing the program, funding the program perhaps, to, to work on it. So the main people that are in charge of the program. So it probably is some administrators and managers and some line staff. But somewhere in the process, so they may come up, that group of people may come up with the primary model from, you know, build it up from the ground, but then you should check it with anyone else who is touched by or touches the program, any other stakeholders. So your funders, your clients, um, other agencies that you work with, you're going to want to bring them in to fine tune the logic model. But really that original development process, the people who know what resources go into the program, what activities are being done, those are typically going to be the people that work on the program, but ultimately bring everybody in to comment on it at some point. And that just helps with the communication and making sure you're not forgetting something. There may be an outcome that clients realize that you didn't even intend, and you may want to add that. And so just having program staff work on it, you may miss some different things. Or there may be something that another agency, a benefit that they see from you improving your data quality or having innovations in the legal services provision that they see that you're not aware of that you would want to add to your logic model ultimately. All right. It seems like that was our last question. Um, so I'd like to thank Susan for this very informative um, presentation that she did for us today. Again, it will be recorded and posted online. We will send everyone who's attended an email and let you know when it's posted online. Um, if you'd like to download the handouts, now's your last chance. Um, but of course, we can send them to you as well if you'd like to reach out to us. Um, but they're available in the handout section of your GoTo webinar control panel. You just click on the title and be able to download them. Um, so thank you so much, Susan. I think this was great information. Thanks so much to Hilary Dallin and Elizabeth Petrui as well, and all of our attendees. Have a great afternoon, everyone.